Yes, indeed. Here we are, Campfire Evergreen, as you can see right there from the sign. The Modern Eater Show live right now, on the air everywhere. This is going to be a treat for you today, but I have a programming note. Zach Johnson, come on over here. Zach Johnson, the Spice Guy. Jared Leonard just pulled in. We're going to get this sucker going. We're going to get a tour of this beautiful place, but all next week and then until the 10th, I'm stepping out. Juan Padro stepping in. So for 10 days, he'll be here for five shows, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and next week, and then Monday, Wednesday. This dude has a lineup of stars that's going to be on the show. It should be amazing. I'm talking about Denver Broncos. I'm talking about maybe a mayor or two. I'm talking about... Uh, network stars. Yes, Woo. and um, a, a Bachelor star as well. So that's going to be all next week. Stay tuned for that. All right, let's get going. Where's Jared Leonard? Jared, come on out of here. You got a big old fan base waiting for you, baby. I know. It's like Elvis is in the building. Grab your mask. It's in his truck. All right, we're all set right here. So again, we're right here at Kever Evergreen, in Evergreen, a campfire. We're going to do a little bit of R&D today. Let's do it. What does that mean? So usually in this scenario, I meet with somebody like Jared, specifically Jared in this case, and we just kind of roll through what the menu might look like and then try to refine down from there and uh you know a lot of the stuff that we could do here which is like a rotisserie rotisserie cooking some chicken some pork some fish uh you know we'd sort of just bring the gamut and then narrow in from there and sort of see if we if we want to go flavors all over the world or if we were trying to get this texas style or if we're trying to get this specific style uh, and we sort of narrow that down from here, but today's like the most open-ended version of that that we're going to do. Absolutely. But we know we're starting with chicken, and we know we're going to do some vegetables. And basically, ahead of time, you call and say, okay, new restaurant opening up, what are your needs? And then you get ready for them. Yeah, basically, like, what is the concept, right? Like, we can take it from such an easy, big, like, you know, 10,000-foot view. <laughs> Hi, Jared. We could go Hi, from Jared. a 10,000-foot view and sort of hone in from there and... You know, Jared and I will just work together closely doing that, and today would be like the first version of what we're up to. Beautiful day in Evergreen, Jared. Can you hear me? Sweet. Welcome, Th guys. This project, man. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Let's just give an overall view. First of all, Evergreen right here. This is a, a perfect piece of property. When I saw it, you've got these palatial views. You've got this great wide open concept. It didn't come like this, though, did it, Jared? No, no. It was an old 7-Eleven turned into a soup shop, and we had a retail business. And I'm you losing know. him, man. Okay, um, microphone squared testing, away. Testing, we good? Gotcha, good. 7-Eleven. Yeah, so it's a classic, you know, 60 by 40 7-Eleven building with a big parking lot and a bunch of cigarette ads on the mezzanine. <laughs> uh, it looked a little different than that when we took it, but not much. So we've turned it into, you know, the, the main thing I saw on this property was the outdoor space. We've, we're, we're facing the right direction, so the sun is on us all day long. Uh, we, Wait, we're, I'm disoriented. Where's the west? Uh, that direction ish. That the direction. sun rises over there yeah. and sets over there. Man, okay. So we've got sunshine on the building all day long, which boom, we've boom. got the windows wide open. I did an indoor outdoor setup. I just say, you know, I love outdoor eating, al fresco dining, and there's uh -huh. just nothing up here. Uh, no one up here doing that yet. And I live up here, so selfishly, I wanted a, a cool restaurant property by my home yeah. I could work at and share some of my passion for food. I was going to say, below the camel and marble signs, these beautiful windows were not sitting there, were they? No. Kind of give us an idea as we walk through here. And, and truly, the work that you've done on this place alone, and you're just your scrappy nature, it's remarkable, Jared. And just hats off to you. I really commend you for how you've done this. Thanks. Let's you know, take a walk through. Sure. So, it's, uh, you know, it all starts with the idea that I wanted an indoor-outdoor space. So I wanted these windows to be fully retractable. I didn't want to do garage doors just because the height of the building isn't tall enough to do that. And you've just seen it in a lot of places. So I, I found these windows. I brought them in from overseas, and, and uh, they fold all the way open. And on a day like today, it's only 45, 50 degrees, but it feels great in here. So I think we'll have these windows open probably 250 days a year and, uh, you know, be able to tie the indoor with the outdoor. We've got an outdoor kitchen we're working on. There's going to be a volleyball court. Just a lot of al fresco activities really focusing on you know, enjoying the beautiful weather and the beautiful scenery that Colorado has to offer. Oh, my goodness. So what are you going to have a wait staff? Is yep. it going to be counter service? Uh, table service. So 
We only have about 40 seats inside, but you know, I, I wanted to build our kitchen big enough that we could do anything we wanted to do. So every toy you could ever imagine from a four deck wow. pizza oven to a wood-fired rotisserie, wood-fired grill. Later on, we added a, a imported from Italy pizza oven that actually is gonna be outside on a kitchen we're building outside. Smoker, another outdoor grill and, and uh, a couple smokers. So every kitchen toy you could ever imagine you know, we really want to do rotisserie chicken in a way that you haven't seen it before. Wood fired, well seasoned, you know, uh, free range chicken. So good bird, good seasoning, cooked with live fire. And that's, that's always been a passion of mine from the time I started, from the time I was a little kid to the time I opened my barbecue restaurant. Cooking with live fire has always been something that I really enjoy and I love just adds an element of flavor to the food that you mm -hmm. don't get cooking with gas or electric. Yeah, those of you and, and most people by now know Jared Leonard, but, uh, Pizza concept, right? Yeah, Krabowski's. Krabowski's yep. You've got your Bud Long yep, chicken. Bud Long hot chicken, yeah. Hot chicken concept. And yep. then just barbecue, right? AJ's Pit Barbecue. Look at that. AJ's Pit Barbecue. So I don't know, Zach, in my estimation, we've gone to all of those places and I love all of the things that you do with this, but it seems like just a different opportunity to show off some more skills. I love it. Yeah. Fire, though. Yeah, live fire cooking has always been a passion of mine. Again, since the time I was. A little kid, we cooked outside. That was one of my fondest memories from a, being a kid is cooking outside on grills. I was a Boy Scout. I was a dorky Boy Scout all the way through Eagle Scout. But it taught me how to cook on an open fire. We'd go camping and cook every meal for a week over an open fire. And as I got older, and I wasn't in Boy Scouts anymore, uh, it, it, it turned out to be a unique skill that I have that most people don't have. So it's something I always have enjoyed, and it's kind of been natural for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, it, I bring it into our restaurants. And, and I'm a storyteller. Love so the, the story here is the idea of a campfire. When we would arrive to a campsite it is in scouting, we would build the fire before we'd set up tents. So the fire happened first, and that's the gathering place for the whole weekend. Uh -huh. And you know, culturally across the world, that's been the case from indigenous cultures to rural America, where the fire is the center of conversation. It's where you cook, you can use it for heating fuel. So there's a lot, there's a lot more to the fire than just cooking. So the idea of campfire is yeah. gathering people together, tell stories, have fun, congregate, eat a good meal. So th true. And you know, I don't know what it is with guys, but you get guys around, we just stare. At yeah. the fire, you know, I don't know. Do, do women, I, I don't ch check to see, but do women love to stare into fires uh, like guys do? You have know. to find one to hang out with you long <laughs> enough first. That's right. You know, fire, fire, it's just, you know, it's, it's very, the effect of it's very visceral. It is. And there, there's a lot of, uh, Francis Malman is a really well-known live fire cook, and he talks a lot about how mankind literally changed, like we changed as people from cavemen after we discovered fire. because we learned how to fire. Meat, right? Yeah. Before that, you're chawing on raw meat and it takes two hours to eat a piece of meat because it's raw and tough. And then after we started cooking meat with fire, it becomes tender. Our actually whole head skeletal structure started to change, gave us more time to think and do the things that we were you know, meant to do. And so wow. as a civilization, we changed when fire was created. So the natural draw to it, I think is pretty, pretty cool, but there's, it's, there's a lot of depth to that. Truly, and, and I, I love those types of esoteric conversations, but uh, and always a wealth of knowledge. I love the storytelling that you bring to that. We are going to go over and see some fire cooking, but we're also going to test out some spices. And just like anything else, spices are very key to cooking. Absolutely. Um, temperature. Yeah. Temperature is everything with fire. Mm -hmm. You got to know your temperatures and how to manipulate that fire and bring it to the right thing for right cooking and surfaces, whether you're finishing or cooking or however. We'll go through some of that stuff. We'll break away. We are in Evergreen at Campfire with Jared Leonard and the Spice Guy. It doesn't get any better than this. I'm so excited that you gave us a sneak peek. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, this is the first time we're cooking birds on the rotisserie. So is it really? Excited. Absolutely. Yeah. Pretty excited. We're going to do it. Okay, break away. Come back to Evergreen with Jared Leonard at Campfire. Back in a flash. Hey. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? This is Brother Luck from Lucky Dumpling, 4 by Brother Luck in Colorado Springs, and I am rocking with the Modern Eater. You're watching them. You're tasting them. You're knowing everything there is to know about Colorado. <laughs> Hi, Charlie from Brews Beers here. Our new Belgian Abbey Four Pack is a mixed package of the four core beers made in Abbey and Trappist breweries in Belgium. So we have a single, a double, a triple, and a quadruple in one package. Now, quadruples are the emperors of Belgian monastery ales. 
They're dark in color uh, with a dense tan head and alcohol ranging from 8 to 12 percent. So they're pretty strong. Quadruples are very rich and complex with big maltiness, uh, spice, and flavors of raisins, cherries, and plums. Alcohol is apparent in the mouthfeel, but not overwhelming, uh, even at 10.5% ABV. So the finish is long, complex, and dry, and they're great beers anytime, by themselves or with hearty foods. Pick up your Abbey 4 pack at either Brews location, 67th and Pecos, or at Colfax in York, and at fine liquor stores throughout the Denver metro area. Take home some Belgian-style badassery today. We're watching The Modern Eater, and now back to the show. Okay, back to Evergreen right now at Campfire, and again, just a programming note, Juan Padro. Restaurant tour Juan Padro is going to be stepping in while I go out of town to Florida for just a uh, few days. But uh, the next five shows, Juan Padro is going to step in and look forward to that programming. It's going to be good. Okay, just like this, you're getting going. Things are getting rebooted. You need to have your taps either installed or maintained. Who does that? Jeff Rourke and A-Plus Beverage Solutions. Man has been in the business 20 years. He's a family man, a family-owned and operated business. He is the authority on installing tap lines. Get a hold of Jeff. It is very important to pour efficient beer because if you're pouring in efficient beer, Jay, what are you doing? You're pouring it down the drain. Don't pour your money down the drain. Just get a hold of the man. Jeff Rourke and A-Plus Beverage Solutions, 720 272-3809. One more time for you. 720-272-3809. Back to Jared Leonard and the Modern Eater Show right here getting a sneak peek in Evergreen. We're going to talk chicken right now. Not talking turkey. We're talking chicken. And you have a love for chicken as well, don't you, Jared? Absolutely. My first uh, chicken restaurant is the Bud Long Hot Chicken. We do a Nashville-style fried chicken. We do smoked chicken at AJ's Pit Barbecue. And then here we're doing the wood-fired rotisserie. Okay, before we get going, Zach Johnson, the Spice Guy. What up? Uh, for those that don't know, the Spice Guy, what do you do for folks? Well, we do tons of stuff. I mean, the most basic piece that we do is deliver spices to your restaurant. But I think on what we do better than that a lot of the times is come in and meet with somebody like Jared and sort of open up the horizon even bigger than it might already be for him. So in this case, we've brought, I don't know, any about 20 or so different spice blends. And this will help us get an idea of like where we're going to go with this menu. And so he's saying like, hey, we're going to have rotisserie chicken. And it's like, okay, cool. That, you know, that's awesome. And that sounds great. But like, what kind of flavors are you going to try to infuse into that? Is it going to be like barbecue style chickens? Are we going to have some stuff from overseas? Are we going to have, you know, Texas style, Louisiana style, or is it going to be a myriad of all of that? And so, you know, we kind of just bring the gamut, work our way down and go from sure. there. And we'll probably end up doing something custom for Jared in the end, where it's a combination of a couple different things, maybe a little bit more of this, a little bit more of that some more salt, some less salt, uh, just kind of use today to get a, a nice vision of where we're going. To gauge it, the tweaking yeah. process. And Jared totally. knows his flavors of what he wants to dial in. Show that rotisserie real quick, if you would, Jay, and just see what he's working so, with. So you're going to be tasked with making delicious chicken, Jared, on your rotisserie, amongst other things here. Yep. But where do you begin? This is why I love this real-life conversation of where we're going to begin. So Jared... And uh, Zach, just take it away, Zach. This is where you begin with um, your potential customer. Yeah, so Jared and I have met a couple of times. We do spices for AJ's Pit Barbecue. Uh, I sort of know the backstory of his kind of flavor, I guess, map of how he flavors things so out. So you did already. your homework first, you know. Yes, I mean, usually, and like usually we'd get on the phone and rap about like, hey, you're going to have this kind of restaurant. We did yesterday, right? Like, we're going to have this kind of restaurant. We're going to do these like definite five dishes. And then from there, like the sky is kind of the limit, whatever we can come up with. That's great. And, and not only is it going to be great, it's going to be simple and easy. And those are things that I think a lot of restaurant tours overlook when they're opening their restaurant. You know, they want to have the best food and, and sure, we're going to have the best food. But Jared's not going to be here cooking every day, so we need to make this replicable for every single yeah, line it. cook that's going to be in Evergreen. Okay, Jared, let's do it. What are we doing? We're going to check out some of these spices here on what you want to do. Cool, so yeah. We wrapped yesterday about having 
a golden herb barbecue-ish kind of seasoning, right? So, yep. so we twisted up our Carolina gold and I brought some of just like a herb-based chicken blend that we already have. So I figured we could start there and sort of use both of these and get that flavor that you wanted. And from here, we'll build off that, right? If Jared's like, hey, it's like a little bit too salty, we can dial that back down. Too much mustard, we can dial that back down. But for the most part, we're gonna get that like nice, sweet, salty herb stuff that we were talking about yesterday. And to tie that together, the Carolina Gold, uh, in South Carolina, they have a barbecue sauce that's a mustard-based barbecue sauce. Mm -hmm. So uh, a rub that has a little bit of mustard in it is a Southern Carolina-style flavoring. It's a really nice undertone to other herbs, though. So usually do it in a two-layer rub with You the can mustard. emulate that sauce with a rub? Yeah, absolutely. Powdered Boy. mustard, yeah. I would love to try that. A little sure. bit of sweet there and a little bit of brown sugar in there, I assume? Yeah, so exactly. Like that brown sugar component, and just like we do at all the restaurants, it's not real brown sugar. It's more of a dehydrated brown sugar bit so that it'll never clump up. It has like always this nice flow to it so that every time you go to get it out, you don't have to beat it with a bat to make it usable. So what I like to do is just put them out here and let the chef taste them and kind of tell me, hey, yeah, that's good. I think like let's just rip that onto a chicken and see where we end up. Um, and we can kind of get our get dialed in and you know a lot of times i'd take a back seat here and let these guys rip i brought this stuff i kind of know what it tastes like so we just let them get their hands on it and season up a chicken and they'll have an idea after tasting it of what they want to do because this is their profession so let her rip if there's something else that you're looking for i think we can add that in at the moment but if you're just saying hey that you know that seems pretty all right honestly we could just rip nice selection you got here yeah so i sort of brought everything that we talked about yesterday from white meats all the way over to red meats. I didn't know quite how far we were going to get today, but this way I can leave some stuff here with you and you can kind of keep going through stuff as you begin to cook more of the proteins. Yeah, if, and if we have time actually, because uh, I haven't seen a couple of these before, what's in the Frisco rib rub? So it's a, it's a, a super sweet uh, rib rub. It's going to be pretty good brown sugar, a couple different uh, chilies that we grow on our farm down in Mexico. Nice. Um, you know, there's always going to be paprika and salt mm -hmm. and, you know, just a myriad of chili powders to get that in there. Can Ultimately, taste yeah, taste away, man. Ultimately, yeah. it's going to be that that sweet chili flavor that you want out of the ribs. And what I like using the brown sugar so much is because it caramelizes as you cook and especially over the fire. You get that caramelization. It helps lock in all those flavors oh, on the protein. You're not losing juice out of every orifice of the animal and sort of helps keep that thing as juicy as we can get it. That's real good. Thank you. What's your go-to, Jared? Like, if you just start from scratch. Oh, you know, we have a 14-ingredient rub we use at AJ's uh, that they blend up for us, and it's got a lot of ingredients in it. I won't go over it, but it's kind of sweet, kind of heat, and a little bit of herb, and so it's, it's pretty well-rounded. We use that for ribs and for, for pork and for chicken. And then on the beef, we're a lot more simple because I want the beef flavor to really stand out. You know, beef loves black pepper. Uh, not a lot of sweetness on beef for me, mm -hmm. but you know, black pepper and salt, like Texas style brisket is just salt and pepper mm -hmm. if you do it traditionally. Uh, but you know, you put a little bit of brown sugar in there, maybe a few other ingredients. Our beef rub is like six ingredients, our pork and chicken rub is 14. Uh, but you know, it's really, it, there's no right or wrong way to do it. That's what's fun about spices is seasoning a dish is really up to a chef and it can rotate and you could have two or three different styles of chicken mm -hmm. that's cooked the same way with different seasoning on it. It's a totally different dish. Do you mind walking us through your menu of what that will look like? Yeah. So, you know, I, I had some guys in here earlier in the week. And to be clear, I'm not going to be the executive chef here. I'm going to be the owner of the restaurant and work all the moving parts. But there is so much that a chef is going to have to do in this store because our menu is very, very deep. Mm -hmm. We're still actually looking for the right guy. Uh, it might end up being me in the beginning, but we're, we're looking for an executive chef that's going to cook with wood fire on a grill, on a rotisserie. I have a pizza guy already who's been working at Marco's Coal Fired. His uncle owns it. He's been there for you know, his whole life, so he's going to run the pizza oven because that's a separate skill. So everything we're doing here is technically advanced as it gets. So cooking with live fire. Uh, we have a, a four-deck oven. And we're we're going to be making all naturally 11 Ooh, bread. Look at that bad boy. Skillet dishes. I mean, it's really kind of every toy I ever wanted to have in a restaurant I put in here. The, the backside of that, though, is a lot of skill, talent, and time to operate it all. So... You know, it's going to be a collaboration between uh, an executive chef that's highly talented, a baker that's highly talented, me is kind of directing the, their steps in every direction, and then our culinary team that advises on other stuff in the group will help them out too. But 
You know, so, so anybody who's listening and looking or has friends who are looking to do something a little bit different, come up to Evergreen. It's beautiful up here. It's 31 minutes from like Wash Park. So it's not a, not a hard commute. I-70 never has traffic up to here, west of here it does, but we're kind of the first mountain town, if you will, outside of Denver and the easy drive and a fun work environment. And I'm awesome. So you can come work <laughs> for me. And, and so along those lines, because I, I really love that call to action out there, chefs, um, the type of chef, the ethos that you're looking for. I know the culture is very important to you as well, and, and they work very closely with you. Yeah. But the, the type of chef that you're looking for experience-wise. Uh, you know, someone who's run a high-volume kitchen. Uh, my, uh, a friend of mine just bought El Rancho, which is an old steakhouse up here. It's 20,000 square feet. And his executive <laughs> chef, he took from Ocean Prime. So we're, we've got high-caliber chefs coming up to Evergreen to execute menus. But I'll tell you, because it's such a large space and there's not, there aren't a lot of restaurants up here, so any of them that do well are very, very busy. So you need to be a chef that understands high volume. There's so many moving parts here that you need to be able to direct a team, a team of people who are all gonna be kind of individually skilled, but then you oversee all of it. And then with all of this live fire cooking equipment, mm -hmm. you really have gotta be a doer and somebody who's not afraid to roll your sleeves up. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, live fire equipment never breaks because there are really no moving parts other than a rotisserie. So you're never going to have a gas valve problem. You're never going to have an electric problem or any of that stuff. But on the flip side of that, you need to know how to manage a fire. You need to know how to kind of work with your senses and your intuition as opposed to just like setting a timer and, and walking away. It's just, it's not, it's very un, it's, it's actually very traditional cooking, but it's less, you know, less modern. science, it's more like, art. Exactly, exactly. And yep. how, how to keep your fuel consistent. Yep. Uh, which is going to be big, too. So back to your menu. Have you constructed this menu? And then also people are probably like, when's the opening date? Yeah. The, is that in your mind yet? Or is it just when the time is right? Yeah. I will know. So we're looking at March-ish right now. We're pretty much done with most of the work. And we just need to have some final inspections and licensing yeah. and things going on. we got to build the outdoor kitchen now. And, and that'll be... We're going to look at that. Know, that'll take mind. a little bit of time. but uh, So, you know, TBD, but March-ish, which will be great because... You know, between March and June up here, half of the days it's 60 degrees and beautiful, and the other half of the days there's two feet of snow on the That's ground. That's right. So it's a great time to get a concept going that relies a lot on outdoor service because we can get a team in here mm -hmm. that'll be busy for three or four days, and you have to be busy to learn what you're doing, to learn the dance, but then it'll dump two feet of snow and we'll be back to our 35 Shit. feet dining room. That's right. We can reel everything in, tighten everything up, and then when the snow melts three days later, be back with the 100 seats, including the patio and the outdoor area and all of that stuff. To so, go? I mean, chicken travels well. So that was the other component of this. They actually, we started developing this before COVID, but all of our restaurants have always done a lot of to-go food, and I, I really believe in it. I don't think that because you're taking food home, it needs to be boring or not taste good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when COVID hit, our restaurants were really optimized for this already, and this concept is not to, to be excluded from that. We're going to be doing box dinners or tray dinners that are rotisserie chickens, but not whole like this. They'll be cut up already by our staff. They'll be plated with side dishes. And so when mom wants to pick up, mom or dad wants to pick up a rotisserie chicken, instead of going to Costco and getting one that you have to then cook the sides for, mm -hmm. get the bread for, you know, get the vegetables going, uh, plate everything, cut up the chicken. Yeah. Instead, you're going to pick up one platter and we have an app we're developing. So that'll be ready right before we open. So wow. it's not like we're going to ease into this stuff. We're going to have everything going where you can order on our app, order a little rotisserie platter, come and pick up two chickens, four sides, and some, you know, some fresh baked bread, and come home and be a hero, just plop it on your table. And we have a, we have a drive through on the side of the building. You do not. Well, it's not a drive through <laughs> in the traditional sense of like yeah. McDonald's, but uh -huh. uh, have you ever been to like a Dutch Brothers coffee shop? Sure. How they have a guy outside with a tablet? It'll yeah. be like that, where our back door is right off this kitchen. That's fantastic. So you pull up and on our app, we have a feature. You don't need to show them the back door. That's not the real door. <laughs> We're Don't show up the back door, Jay. Not yet. We're not going to have the nice back door in yet, but that's all right. You guys get it. It's under construction-ish. Sure. Uh, we're 95% of the way yeah. there. Um, but you pull up at the back door, click on the I'm here button on the app, and then our staff just runs the food out. You don't have to park. You don't have to come in. That's you don't awesome. have to have the interaction and the transaction of dealing with, you know, you know, you've paid already. Like, all that's done. So we want to make it nice and simple because a lot of folks that live up here work in Denver, and they travel home, and they want to get home. They don't want to be out if they have mm -hmm. two or three kids waiting for them at home. So they stop by here, pick up your rotisserie platter, boom. So we're pretty excited about our to-go program. That'll be big. The wood-fired pizza really was like an audible in the middle of this. And if you know, I was me, wondering. You know me well enough yeah. to know that that's how everything I do happens. Like, hey, let's do this, and let's add this, and let's add this. And then eventually it becomes what it's going to be, right? Sure. 
A guy approached me who had been cooking wood-fired pizzas for years and said, hey, I'd love to come and run an oven at your place. And I actually have an oven from Italy uh, in a Kunta, which is a really expensive, hand-built, traditional Italian brick oven. And he's like, I can sell you the oven if I come with it and can work for you to run the oven. And I was like, that's a deal. That sounds like a great deal for both of us. So. Interesting. So that was kind of an add-on, but so, wood fire pizza to go to. And you kind of had it, the the deal breaker would have been it's not wood fire. I mean, you got to have the wood fire oven for campfire evergreen. Yeah, you know, I have the deck oven, and we were going to do flatbreads and pizzas in there, and we still are going to probably use that for a lot of our bread baking, of course. But wood fire pizza, you know, so, Neapolitan style, cooked in ninety seconds absolutely. or less. Absolutely. We had just some nice fresh cheese on there, like simple pies that have just cheese sauce herbs like just simple ingredients or good charcuterie if we're going to go with a meat pie yeah. i've always loved wood-fired pizza neapolitan style and just you know it, this is an opportunity for us to do it it fits with the theme so it, chicken is the center point though absolutely yeah so the okay. rotisserie is kind of where the story starts sure. and we build on it from there okay so, so is it sides I, I i'm trying to grasp in my head this menu and what it's going to look like so think of a boston market i was you're going to slap me if i would have done no, no, that that's okay so okay. think of a Elevating boston market boston market but then like get like a dozen creative chefs in a room and have them make it awesome. And that's what this will be. You know, good sides, fresh bread, well-seasoned chicken, a story around it. You know, uh, this is not to knock Boston Market, but they've, I've always loved that concept. Yeah. You know, I really have. Uh, I understand that it had been different at one time. I'd never experienced the good Boston Market, truthfully. It's really hard to do food like this at scale. So like, you know, you'll never see two or three campfires. You'll never see two or three AJs. Mm -hmm. But long eye scale, different concept. But the mm -hmm. live fire cooking, you know, you really want to, to keep a small team that can manage it properly so we don't compromise quality. Yeah. So, you know, we'll have whipped potatoes. Cornbread. We'll Please tell me you're going to have your cornbread. Cornbread up here, you know, uh, just seasonal vegetables. A lot of Colorado sourced uh, items. So we're working with what chefs to want that. to bring produce out from the Western Slope <laughs> so we can have, you know, Colorado ingredients that we're using in our cooking. And, you know, the further you get... It, like Denver loves Colorado, mm -hmm. but the further you get into the mountains, mm -hmm. the more everybody loves Colorado. Yeah. So having Colorado local produce in a mountain town like Evergreen, I think it's going to be great. So it's just fun to talk about sourcing and fun to talk about where items are coming from. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you guys are doing your dinners again. I would love to incorporate yeah. some of uh, what we're doing here into oh, man. that. You know, that would be absolutely awesome. Uh, anytime in business, a good story. And you're probably the best storyteller that I know. I got to have, uh, before we break away, I got to have you show folks this. Oh, my tattoo. It's a beautiful piece of art. So it I, really I've, is. You know, chefs all have tattoos and I've never had one and I've, I've almost made the appointment a dozen times and a couple no actually in october i said i want to get a tattoo that represents seasons of my life and things that i stand like you know that are that are that are consistent in my life so these are trees these are aspen trees some of my favorites start in the spring with buds on them and into the summer fall and winter and then behind them are the evergreen trees that never change so it kind of represents the just you know i really enjoy all the seasons of my life i i haven't you know, just like anybody, you have ups and you have downs, but I wouldn't trade any of it because it's all learning experience. Yes. So, you know, that's what this represents. And uh, I'm already working on tattoo number two because these are fun. That's why we love some Jared Leonard, man. The stories are great. We'll tell some more stories when we get back. We'll finish up with this R&D with the Spice Guy. Uh, to me, the spices are center point of any kind of just good, flavorful food. Sometimes you have too much spices. Sometimes you don't have enough. But uh, the Spice Guy gets you on the road for that. When did you put these chickens in? Uh, 12 o'clock, 12.30. We might be able to butcher them soon. How long yeah. does it take a chicken to work? We'll, we'll, we're gonna we'll ask that when we get you, back. I told you this is the first time we're This is the chicken. first time. Okay, we'll break away. We'll come right back. This is a sneak peek, you guys. We good, are though. in Evergreen at Campfire. Campfire Evergreen. And this is a kind of, I, I don't know, a special project to you, yeah, Jared. Really. Absolutely. And I think that this project is really a symbolization of the time in life that you're in right now. Yeah. And we'll tell the story of Campfire, how it came about, and all of this hard work in here, the nuances that you look around and see. You see them all, don't you? Yeah. Just very, very intimately involved with this place. Okay, we'll be back in a flash. The Modern Eater Show continues. Hi, I'm Amber with Strohauer Farms. And I'm just here to remind you that the best potatoes are grown here in Colorado. Goodness elevated. Thanks for watching the Modern Eater Show. <laughs> hey, Zach Ryder here, Colorado Mills Sunflower Products out of Lamar, Colorado. Your only local source 
grown from a local crop to produce a local oil for local chefs. You can find it at Shamrock Foods, What Chefs Want, Seattle Fish Company. Uh, let me try it one more time, then we'll see. Hey, restaurants, we're glad you're reopening. From Colorado Mills Sunflower Oil, we'll see you soon. <laughs> First, we partner with the best farmers in the world, and then we tell them, we will take it all. Process whole spices daily, blend custom spices to order, keep it fresh, safe, and flavorful, all so that you can get back to doing what you do best. So whether you're a restaurant, a food manufacturer, or an at-home cook, be sure to visit The Spice Guy at www.thespiceguyco.com. Hey, Modern Eater fans. I'm Don Trobo with The Annex by Art at Mills, and I just wanted to give you a heads up about some of the great things we've got going on locally in the state. We're headquartered right here, and we're working with farmers in the San Luis Valley to bring you amazing Colorado quinoa. It's just like the South American stuff, but grown locally. We've got transitional wheat flour that's grown by farmers in Colorado and surrounding states who are in the process of, of turning their fields into organic. So we're taking that transitional wheat and turning it into flour, and now it's available for you to cook and bake with. And last but not least, we're now cleaning grain berries in Denver. So things like spelt or wheat berries uh, or pearl barley, those are things that we're now doing right here locally and are available to you. Can't wait to share it with you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Nations from Aspen Baking Company. It's really important right now to support local. That's why I support the Modern Eater. Now, back to the show. All right, you guys, back to the show in just a second. But before we do that, I want to talk to you about Aspen Baking. Now, listen, not everybody has the facility like Jared Leonard to do their baking. A lot of people don't have the means. And if you don't have the means, you go to aspenbaking.com and they will hook you up. They will hook you up with the freshest bread in the city since 1994, chefs. Since 1994, you can order direct, you can order online, you can use Amazon Fresh. You go to AspenBaking.com for all your baking needs. And if you're a bread lover like me, getting a rotisserie chicken and a nice sourdough loaf from AspenBaking.com will change your entire life. I'm not joking. AspenBaking.com for the freshest bread on planet Earth. Now back to the show. Jay, you may have forgotten that Mr. Jared Leonard uses Aspen Baking Company at the Bud Long. Yeah, so we do. I think that's something to Well, I obviously there. did. Jared, tell us a little bit about the Aspen Baking. You use a Bud Long real uh, quick. So we use the softest buns in the business at uh, Bud Long Hot Chicken. They're a brioche-style buttery bun, great for our Bud Long Hot Chicken sandwich. You know, we tried every brand out there. We even brought our bread in from Chicago for a while, and, and we found Aspen. That was the one. And so we, we go through three, 400 of those a day at our Bud Long Hot Chicken, 81 South Pennsylvania Street. That's right. And, Jay, you will never forget that again after that. You know you will not. All right, here we go back to uh, Evergreen and Campfire. Campfire Evergreen. You want to put Evergreen in the name, right? Or yeah. is it? I mean, it's, it's Campfire, Campfire Evergreen, subtitled with Evergreen Colorado. You know, so... Uh, Yes and no. You can call it either. So if you were to have a campfire somewhere else, not say you would, Evergreen wouldn't be in it. I don't know, man. It's yeah, I don't, know. I, don't, you know, I don't know that I would scale this. And if I did, it would be different. This would always be special and different yeah. than the ones that I built multiple of. Yeah. You know, we've already, obviously, that's, first thing I think about it as a multiple business owner is, is, is it scalable? That's not in my head at all with this. Huh? You know, a lot of the things that I did here are breaking every rule I've ever told anybody about opening a business. Uh -huh. Spending more, getting more, sure. making it nicer before we're actually making anything. But this is, you know, restaurant build number 11. So I Ooh. wanted to make it special. I live up here. We just bought a house up here. We're not going anywhere. So Go ahead. Uh, this is really a passion project and Campfire Evergreen. I, I, I think I, I, for now, we're just sticking with one. Yeah. Um, I love the passion that you put into projects, but truly, when you see when you when you see a space first, do you know what you want to do going into it? I love your business mind, or do you just let the space come to you? I kind of let it speak to me. It's it's hard to remember exactly how it evolved, but I came to see the space. We've been here for three years, and I, you know, the first thing that people say when we talk to our neighbors, is they say we love it up here, but there aren't enough restaurants. And they find out that I'm in the restaurant business and they right away, oh, you got to open a store up here. And we said, no, we did that in Chicago. We lived in the city. We had six restaurants in the city. We could never get away because we were always close distance to them. And we just kind of want to live in Evergreen and have restaurants in Denver. But after being here for three years, I truly grew frustrated that there weren't dining options up here. Uh, you know, when I was building this, I ate at Taco Bell like 20 times this summer. 
That's crazy. I haven't eaten at Taco Bell five times since I was 20 years old. But there aren't a lot of other dining options up here, and it's changing a little, but we wanted to be part of that. So, you know, I saw the space and I thought, what could I do up here that would be special? And I'd been kicking around the idea of rotisserie chicken. I'm already cooking chicken at Bud Long. I do the wood fired smoking at AJ's. So those two definitely played into the story of this. And then, you know, when I took the building over, it was a retail store, it wasn't a restaurant. So it was kind of a blank canvas, but also full of stuff. So it was like gutting it completely, filling three dumpsters full of stuff. And then every piece of the project kind of came along in stages. You know, the idea to make it indoor outdoor, the idea to leave it open in the rafters and just spray foam instead of drop ceiling again. Uh, all the lighting, the counter in front, and the tile on that. It, we, did, we redid the tile on the counter twice. After it was finished, tore it out and redid it. Because, you know, I worked with the designer on this to mock up uh, the, the vision, but then changed several things as we were going, just because I wanted it to be exactly how I envisioned. And I wasn't exactly sure what that was when yeah. we got started. So uh, much like my restaurant group, Stone Soup, that's what the story of Stone Soup is, is adding individual components one piece at a time to make something great. I promise you, before we wrap it up here, we're going to tell you the story about the Stone Soup. And I think that'll resonate with a lot of people because it transcends into so many portions of your life. I'm getting the chills. So you'd <laughs> stick around for that. This is Santa Maria. I, mean, I said, hey, is this kind of like a Santa? You said, this is the Talk about this piece. So they build these, these pits down in Texas, Mesquite, Texas. They're, called J and, they're from a company called J&R Manufacturing. And this is called the Santa Maria Grill. It's a style of cooking that's popular in uh, Santa Maria Valley in California. And it's just uh, it's meant to do, like tri-tip is the most typical meat that they cook on these. So uh, raising and lowering this overall grill apparatus allows you to get the meat really close to the fire to sear it on all sides and then you can raise it up and up here you know you put your hand here now you're like slow cooking it so it's almost like a sear than a smoke when you're doing a tri-tip uh, but you know then when you lower it down obviously you can do any other kind of grilled meats on here so there we go look at that so when it's that low, you know it's going to be up to seven, eight hundred degrees yeah, that's right next to the fire. So if we're doing like a tomahawk steak night or anything else that we want to be grilling super, super hot, we've got the wood fire grill. Now I've got a gas char broiler for when we want to bring meats back that don't necessarily need the wood flavor. If we're doing like chicken for a salad or something, and we've got a flat top, we're going to incorporate some breakfast here. You know, a couple of burners because you need burners. We're going to have fryers. They're not in yet, but we'll have a, the Bud Long chicken sandwich and then our hamburger stand on yeah. the menu as well up here. So. You know, some of the parts of my past will come with us, some of our greatest hits, along with all the new stuff. So again, it's busy kitchen, a lot of space, a lot of stainless. And we work with, uh, I know they're not a sponsor, but I'm going to mention their name anyways. We work with Bar Green Ellison on all of our stainless in the kitchen. I've literally never bought stainless steel brand new from a manufacturer ever. And here we bought like $50,000 of stainless steel because it just... I, again, I, this is open kitchen. Yeah. It's on display in my hometown, my new hometown. So we wanted everything to be perfect and start out with it looking nice. And, uh, you know, that way we can keep the kitchen nice and clean and it does. for, uh, you know, the open appearance to our guests. When Zach and I first got here, I said, I can see where Jared really uh, threw some money in here. <laughs> and, and, and it's true. It's an open kitchen. And back to this rotisserie, because I'm sure there's a story behind it. Rotisserie chicken just in general and why and what? I mean, what's the deal with it? You can just bake it, can't you? Well, yeah, but when it spins like this, you see that it kind of bases itself in the juices as it's turning. It just gives a nice, even cook. So much like when you cook a barbecue, you cook barbecue for two reasons slowly. One is because the, f the meats you, you cook in a barbecue pit are fatty, and so you have to slowly break down the fat so they don't seize up and squeeze all the juices out of them. But two, cooking with a low, even temperature allows something to retain its natural juiciness and flavor, including a leaner meat like chicken. So doing birds on a spinning rotisserie like this, you just see how juicy they are everywhere. If you threw that same bird in an oven yeah. for an hour, it would just be dry and look like shoe leather. It wouldn't look like that. But why? So it kisses the fire and then it goes. I mean, there's a method to, to why and how does it retain the heat? I mean, it's open. Um, so this is insulated in, in brick everywhere. So all three sides, except for the front, obviously, are insulated with brick. This thing weighs about 8,000 pounds. So super heavy duty. Again, J&R Manufacturing, they make smokers also, and their smokers are called oilers. They're giant, you know, big as this room smokers, mm -hmm. and they're heavy duty, they're well built. Uh, so, so, you know, you've got all the heat retention in the wall, fire directly beneath it, and then when they get up, the birds get up here, there's less heat, but 
you know, that gives them a, a little bit of a break from that hot fire and allows them to cook just totally evenly as they spin around. So rotisserie cooking is a really old style of cooking. Like you picture like sure. an old fashioned, like black and white picture or hand drawn, like, yeah. you know, Native American sure. picture of them with an animal on a, on a spit or like just a, a right. stick rotating around a fire to make sure that he cooks evenly without flipping it or cooking it too much on one side before you flip it over. It's a nonstop rotation. You'd see a hydroglyphics in a cave of yeah, absolutely. <laughs> spinning around some chicken. Yeah. I love this method. And to you, when, when you look for equipment, it, you look for art, too, and you look for stories and sturdiness. Yeah. yeah. I love Where'd you get this piece from again? This came from California. So I bought two of these. One of them I bought directly from Texas, and it's a bigger rotisserie. We'll probably have it in our outdoor kitchen. It's at AJ's right now. Then I found this unit on eBay that was connected to a Santa Maria grill. So they build these units custom. So if you call J&R Manufacturing, you say, this is what I want, can you build it for me? And I, was, I had J&R Manufacturing rotisserie like on my RSS feed from all kinds of platforms and one popped up after I had already bought the other rotisserie that's actually bigger than this rotisserie that had both units connected. And I was like, this is just so cool, how could I not put it in my kitchen? So the other rotisserie will be our backup cooker and it'll be outside, but this is kind of the showpiece of what we're doing in here, which yeah. gives us, again, the wood fire grill that I didn't initially plan on having. It's perfect. Um, if you've been to AJ's Pit Barbecue, you're going to see the same kind of storytelling and yep. just the, the barbecue fashion. And uh, as we reopen it back up, I know education is very important to you yep. as well, telling the education. And not only that, but that's the passion of the Modern Eater show. It's just really, where does your food come from? Where are the purveyors? What are the stories behind it? One of the things so very special to me are some of the, um, the, just the knowledge of how to progress yourself, not only in business, but in life. But one of the things that sticks to me is the stone soup. Mm. What I want to do is I want to break off and start this where we began it and out front here at Campfire in Evergreen. And Jared Leonard, the spice guy, we're going to give you a great story. It's the story of the stone soup, okay, right? Okay, sure. And uh, just stick around for me. This, this gives me goosebumps because it transcends into so many um, meaningful portions of your life as – uh, for me, seasonal depression, the winter time, the mm -hmm. COVID, the, uh, all of those things that add up. And sometimes you need that kind of reset or default point. And I think this may give you a little bit of perspective. So we'll break away. We'll come right back. We'll wrap things up. This is what you get to look forward to, you guys. I mean, look at this rotisserie chicken. You're going to have all great ingredients. You're going to have the story behind it. And truly, that's what it's all about. So whether it's a first date or a hundredth date or a, an anniversary, Campfire is going to be a place where you can go outdoor dining, indoor dining, but it'll be a family place and it'll have delicious food and you'll be able to enjoy yourself to the fullest. So back in a flash, Campfire in Evergreen, the Modern Eater Show continues. Hey, you guys, Jay here with the Modern Eater Show. Thanks for watching. Don't forget about our YouTube and Instagram channels. A lot of killer content over there. Throw us a subscribe on YouTube. Throw us a follow on Instagram. And thank you for supporting TME. We couldn't do this without our amazing sponsors, so let's check them out right now. Very proud to be part of the, the Modern Eater. And uh, chefs, restaurant owners, any food service operators, you know, I know right now that uh, delivery and carry out is bigger than ever, and we got you covered. Uh, Cambro uh, has a full line of uh, delivery and carry out items. More economical options are expanded polypropylene or EPP, a uh, nice insulated container. Uh, the Procard Ultra is really versatile. It's a great unit because you can actually store cold products down here, hot products up here. It's all 120. There's no refrigeration worries. It's all thermodynamics. Just let us know what your food service challenges are, what it is we can do to help you out, and there isn't anything that we can can't do for you. So uh, hope to see you over here at our facility in Park Hill soon and uh, stay safe out there. You know everybody with several million dollars of hard assets here insurance is very very important to us. Ewing Levitt covers it all. Machinery, building, workman's comp. Ewing Levitt's got us covered from the floor to the ceiling, from our alley even to the street. This divider, this press, my cooling conveyor, my oven. Ow, ow! Ewing Levitt covers our counter stacker and our employees too.
If you need insurance, take it from Little Rich at Rockalitas. Call Ewing Levitt, they'll get you covered. I go home, I strip down to my skivvies. All right, here we go. I got it, I got it, I got it. Hey everybody, Steve Gould from Golden Moon Distillery and Golden Moon Speakeasy. When I get my cocktails to go from Golden Moon Speakeasy, I go home, I kick back, and I watch The Modern Eater. <laughs> skivvies. Hey, I'm a Marine. It's skivvies, man. All right, back to Campfire in Evergreen. We're going to show you a toy here in just a second, and we're also going to tell you a great story. Jared Leonard and Zach Johnson, the Spice Guy, here with us now. And on, on the uh, tone of education, man, education right now is so important and just getting tuned up and ready to go. Emily Griffith Culinary Quick Start. We've had the opportunity to work with these folks and their program's been out of Studio Kitchen Colorado, home of the Modern Eater Show, in the evenings. Four days a week, Monday through Thursday. And it's three weeks. It's a gimme. It's a gimme class. Chef Blake is amazing. Chef Marcus as well. Those guys are putting together a great culinary program. So if you're fresh to the business or you just want to refine your skills or maybe you're just a home chef, it's a free program. I encourage you. Go to themoderneater.com. Click on the Emily Griffith tag tab it'll have all the information for you to be able to sign up i hope you join us for the culinary quick start class okay back to jared and back to zach guys first of all toys you got i won't even go over your new toy man that is too cool but these to this toy right here what what is this the bar do you pedal this thing is it oh, a i don't think so it's too heavy for that yeah. the barbecue trailer so you know, we, we have a lot of mobile equipment for barbecue because we do a lot of catering. And this came across my feed, uh, just things people didn't need or want anymore from another barbecue company. And it's not going to land here. It's it's not it's going to be built into our outdoor kitchen. But we've got, a, again, all wood-fired appliances on it. So we've got a, a, a pig roaster on it. I'll open this bad boy up. Put a whole hog on here. Got a little smoker over here that's gonna be replaced by a, a much bigger smoker made by Old Hickory. And then, it, you know, just some additional prep and storage space. And this will be kind of be built into the outdoor space. And when we're busy, you know, the kitchen inside will be just flooded with orders. So having these auxiliary pieces of equipment outside to cook in the pizza oven, the outdoor smokers, the outdoor grills, will take a little bit of a weight off of, or burden off of the kitchen and just allow us to, to increase the menu. And, you know, the smell of outdoor cooking, everybody loves that. So people will be drawn in from all over just with the smell. That's the mind of Jared Leonard. And I love that because I try to be a visionary myself. You look and see what the dream is and you try and work your way backwards on that. But as we look over the just this piece of property that looks like you've excavated quite well and you've got this on here that you say, I'm going to make this a stationary uh, portion and rather than just a trailer. But just look around here, point and show so, us. What do you envision? So this is what we're going to call Campfire Beach. This will all be sand. So the trailer will be over towards the shipping container. The shipping container will be pushed back. That's going to be utilized as a secondary walk-in cooler for outdoor storage space for the outdoor cooking equipment. You know, I would love to have a grassy field here. I would love it. But it's not practical in the hot sun of Colorado, right? It would be green for one month of the year, the, maybe June to July 4th. So instead, you know, we're going to make it Campfire Beach. Something my wife and I have always said is if there was a place for us to, to go where we could enjoy our a food and drink and our kids could play, that's like a home run for anybody who has kids. Because you hate giving them a tablet. And every other restaurant, even if you have a patio, if the kids have nothing to do, they're just making a mess, they're making noise, they're bothering other people and then you feel bad as a parent and you can't relax. So here at Campfire Beach, there's gonna be an area for kids to play, there's gonna be a volleyball net up, there's gonna be the cooking equipment obviously out here, sand everywhere, which will make it, you know, no danger or any kind of fire with our outdoor cooking equipment. And, uh, you know, a, a couple of Adirondack chairs, we might put in some gas fire pits and just make it in a nice area for you to smoke a cigar, have a glass of wine, our liquor license will go all the way to the river. Oh. That is the, uh, the Bear Creek right down there. So there's a fly fishing kind of secret spot right around the corner. You can walk down there if you bring your fishing pole. And Not so secret anymore. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, they used to park. People used to park in this lot because it wasn't occupied for a while and then walk down there and fish, and they're not going to be able to let them do that anymore. But they can uh, come on down here and enjoy a nice meal and but go this, down to their secret fly fishing spot. This is going to be rocking, man. This is 
from for this side of town, the only thing that used to be over here was the Lariat Lodge, yep. which anytime you've ever gone there, it's completely packed. You can hardly yep. get in. They've got live music going. It's, yep. a, it's a really fun experience. And this is going to be that and I assumedly a lot more than that. Mm -hmm. And a place to relax is a, you know, I think you hit it on the head there. Evergreen's a place with tons of people with yep. multiple children. And I think this is going to be the new favorite hangout. Community and family. And boy. And he like really grazed over this thing where he said, and I'm going to turn know, this into a walk-in cooler. <laughs> You just got to insulate it and cool it. That's not interesting. Hard. I mean, back to the kids. I'm sure parents everywhere will appreciate being able to go out, relax, and then have their kids get worn out and go home and Absolutely. sleep. Absolutely. Like you're over <laughs> on the patio or you're on the Adirondack chairs around the fire pit. Your kids are messing around with the volleyball or whatever. And, and you just, it, you know, I've always thought that the experience when you dine out shouldn't be that much different than when you're at someone's home whether that's a nice steak dinner that they prepared or whether it's a barbecue on the back in the backyard where you're all kind of hanging out and playing lawn darts or whatever else. So to be able to have an experience like you're at your friend's house, uh, you know, it, it's all over Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas, er, like so many restaurants are themed this way. And I just haven't seen that out here. And our weather is really great, despite us being a snowy mountain state. It's sunny like 310 days a year. It's actually sunnier in Evergreen than it even is in Denver because, you know, the cloud cover kind of falls down there and it's 7,000 feet up here sunny every day we can use this patio so much so i'm really excited as you can what is it january 20 right? something or another outside is beautiful yeah. out you know jared said can i do the interview with my shirt off i said sure <laughs> man. i mean you don't have to but you should no. um it's <laughs> stunk soup collective the name came from the inspiration i don't know how many years ago jared it's been a book that i've loved since i was a kid uh and you know after we started doing multiple restaurants you need a restaurant group name and one, the story is special to me because I just I remember it just having an influence on how I thought about things. But then it truly is the way we build our restaurants. Uh, you know, I'll tell the short version of the story. My first employee, I met in the alley behind my restaurant and he helped me hang drywall. He worked for me for 10 years. You know, this is a guy who had never really worked in kitchens. But when he came on my team, I saw something. And he had, it was a hardworking dude and he grew with us. And everyone who's ever worked for me, we all kind of bring seemingly insignificant different components to something to make it great and in the story of stone soup is a traveler a weary traveler that's going through town and he asks the locals if they can feed him and they don't know him and they're kind of stingy and who's this guy and they tell him no we can't feed you we don't have any extra sorry sir keep going and he says you know i want to feed you then so he says i just need some wood and a pot i don't need any of your food i'm going to make what i call stone soup and he starts a fire a campfire he puts a pot of water over it and puts a stone in the, in the water and starts boiling and the, the town starts to gather around. What the heck's this guy doing, right? And they said, how is this going to taste good? There's, got a, there's just a stone in it. And he says, well, you know, this is really delicious as it is, but if you had some carrots, that would make it even better. And the one town person says, like, you know, I can spare carrots. I can't feed you a whole meal, but I can bring some carrots. And, you know, he asks another person, like, if you brought some parsley, we could make this great. And one by one, he calls out different insignificant components to a dish that the town, the town folk bring one by one to make this beautiful soup. He feeds all of them and teaches them a lesson about sharing and, again, how insignificant components from multiple people coming together can make something truly beautiful. Think about that in your life. You don't need it all at once. In one fell swoop, there's components of people around you that can lift you up. Zach would have brought the spices. I know you would have. Oh, yeah. You'd have had to twist my arm a bit, but I'd have brought them. <laughs> and making a delicious soup. So, you know, that can transcend into so many areas of your life, and it does. Don't put yourself out on an island. Don't be alone with anything. We're, we're trying to break out of things, and just an inspiration to us all. And Jared Leonard, Campfire, I'd say good luck, man, but I can't wait is what I'm going to tell you. This is going to be fantastic. I'm and excited. I will be out in one of those Adirondacks with Zach, and we're going to have a beer and just kick it right here in Evergreen, Colorado. It's a short, short drive, just like you said, what? 30 minutes door to door. 30 minutes door to door. These are the types of places you want to uh, go to, and these are the types of places you want to do business with. It's local at its finest, and I just have the utmost respect for you, Jared Leonard, and what you do. Thank Likewise. you so much for the tour. Yeah, thanks for having me on. That's right. Okay, we're looking forward to it. Sometime in March, I always say, Jared, there's no better way to get ready than have a deadline. Sure. So March is it. Right. March it is. Okay, so for Zach Johnson... And Jared Leonard and Jay Parker, I'll be off all next week. Juan Padro's filling in. It's going to be some good stuff. I mean, truly, he's got Denver Broncos. He's got uh, 
uh, one of the mayors. I don't know which one, but I think it's going to be good. And also uh, The Bachelor, Ben Higgins, is going to be on with Juan Padro. Carrie Baird's going to be on on Monday. Uh, Fatima, her uh, two-year for passing in the foundation, they'll talk about that on Monday. It's going to be some good programming for you coming up. So for all the boys, we're going to take off. We've got some chicken to tend to, and that's the way that it should be done. And camp at Campfire in Evergreen, Greg Hollenbeck signing off. We'll see you down the road. The Modern Eater Show continues. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I love the laugh. <laughs> like right now? Yeah. <laughs> hey, everybody. It's Kyle Mindenhall. I'm talking with uh, my good friends from the Modern Eaters show. Keep supporting them. There's a lot of good stuff happening. We started Meridium Spirits because we love the way that spirits and cocktails can bring people together to socialize, to bond, to have conversations. Well, right now we've got some big conversations to have. Coop Vodka and Coop Gin are available at liquor stores across the metro area, but if you can't find us or would like to have us behind your bar or at your restaurant, send us an email, info at meridiumspirits.com. We know things are a little different these days, but think of us the next time you're planning a virtual happy hour or a socially distant picnic. And keep an eye on our social media, Coop by Meridium, for all the latest and greatest. Hey guys, it's Caroline Glover. I'm the chef owner of Annette out at Stanley Marketplace. Citrus is about to be in its prime. I just want to thank everybody for showing so much support to small local restaurants in this really hard time and you're watching the Modern Eater Show. <laughs> I'm fine with that.